Hello and welcome. You are watching Impact Television, a part of the media ministry from Forgiven Church located in Bluffton and Fort Wayne, Indiana. We pray that you would have an open mind and ears to hear what God would say to you today. So let's dive right in to one of Pastor Scott's or Pastor Michelle's previous teachings taught at Forgiven Church. Enjoy. Hold up your Bible, hold up your iPad, hold up whatever you got your Bible on and repeat after me. Say, this is my Bible. I believe it was written for me to understand and agree with. I am what it says I am, set free from all the power of the enemy. I will do what it says to do. I will see that it is reality. Amen. All right, you may be seated again. Amen. And Brother Chuck Koneman is with us in the house. Amen. Would you go ahead and stand? Brother Chuck and his wife, Sandy. Um, he was just wandering out in the parking lot this morning. He was wanting a church to go to. So I said, well, I guess you could come to ours. No, Brother Chuck, is he's a chaplain. And he's a chaplain at the, at the secular job where I work. And uh, I mean, he's out there where the action is. I mean, he's out there among the people and, and uh, does a great job, amen. And he's also a minister. He's also a musician. He does a lot of things. But he told me, uh, Merlin, next time you minister, let me know. I want to come listen to you. So uh, I gave him the date, and uh, he's here. And so, uh, but make sure you greet him um, if you can. You didn't bring your cards? Well, Okay, he said he's going to bring cards and hold them up to let me know how I'm doing. So. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, he's got a rough job. It's, it's, it can be tough out there. It can be lonely. I know he came in with, you know, nobody knew him, and he's got to go around and visit with people and everything. And so uh, I appreciate him. I appreciate his stand. Uh, he's not afraid to get into politics. He's not afraid to say how it is or how he feels about stuff. He, he, he takes a strong stand on the Word of God, and it's, it's always good to see people like that. Amen. So thanks for joining me, Brother Chuck, joining us. Amen. All right, Ephesians chapter 5. I think I'm ready now. Ephesians chapter 5. We'll look at our foundation scripture. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. It says... Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation or debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Verse 20, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And verse 18, it says, Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Amen? And uh, the Greek here says, uh, when it talks about being filled with the Spirit, it says, be being filled. This is a, a continual filling. This is not just a one-time filling. This refers to being filled continually. If you look at uh, the complete Jewish version, it says keep on being filled. The Amplified says be ever filled. And we know that being filled with the Spirit is a separate experience from being born again. Amen? And, but there also, there has to be an initial filling, yes, but there also has to be many following refillings. Amen? Because we leak. Right? We leak. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Amen. And our vessel is an earthen vessel. Amen. And then, of course, if we go on and read in verse 19, it says, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Amen. That's what happens when you're filled with the Spirit. Songs come out of you. Hymns come out of you. Melodies come out of you. Amen. You say, well, Brother Merlin, uh, you know, the, the songs and hymns, those, I'm not really into that. I'm not really into songs and hymns, and I think that's been done away with. 
Well, you better have something to sing. The Bible says that God surrounds us with songs of deliverance. And there are times you're going through, through something and you need a song. Yes. Amen. You need a spiritual song. You need a song that you can sing to yourself. Have any of you ever gotten songs that you had to sing? I've done it lots of times. I've got a lot of songs that came up out of my spirit that I had to sing while I was working because I was in the middle of a battle and I was trusting God. And I, I sang these songs, amen. And God delivered, praise God. God healed, amen. amen. Hallelujah. We saw that one of the key aspects to being filled with the Spirit is speaking in tongues. Amen. Everybody say speaking in tongues. And, you know, a lot of people, if you don't understand about speaking in tongues, Pastor Scott did a good teaching on it uh, at the end of last year, and it is still online, live streaming. If you go on there, you will find where he talks about speaking in tongues. He talks about what it's all about. Amen. Some people think that tongues have been done away with. Some people think that tongues are uh, for real, but, and, and people do speak in tongues, but some people think that every time you speak in tongues, you need an interpreter, right? But there's two different kinds of tongues. There's a personal tongues, a personal prayer language, and then there's a corporate tongue where, yes, you do have to have an interpreter. But Paul didn't always have an interpreter. He said, I speak in tongues more than the whole Corinthian church put together. I speak in tongues more than all of you. He didn't always have an interpreter. <laughs> he didn't get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and begin speaking in tongues and, and, and think, oh, I can't speak in tongues right now. I don't have an interpreter. Nobody's awake. Doesn't that sound silly? So there, there's two different kinds of tongues, amen? There's a corporate tongue. There's a personal tongue. And so Pastor Scott went over all that, and uh, uh, we went over that some the last time. But we saw that the characteristics of a person who is filled, and that's what I'm talking about, being filled, being filled with the Spirit, being filled with the Word, being full of God, amen, being full of His power. We saw that the characteristics of a filled person was that they operated in a supernatural way as a Christian. Signs and wonders followed them. They spoke the Word of God Boldly, They were very bold. That's what we saw. The people who were filled were bold. They operated in the supernatural realm. I've been filled, and I know that that's true. Amen? God has used me to do supernatural things because I was filled. So let's go over to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, we'll look at that. I know this is review, but it's important. Colossians chapter 3. Three. It says in verse 15 or 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You see, there it is again. Singing in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So we see here that you get filled with the word, amen? And that we're supposed to be filled with the word. Then we saw in Ephesians that we're supposed to be filled with the spirit, amen? So you can be filled with the word, you can be filled with the spirit. But when I think of Psalms, I think of David. You know, David, it's hard to think about Psalms and not think about David. You know, David had the Spirit of God. I mean, he, he was hungry for God. The Bible says, he said, that the same way a deer pants for the brooks of water, I long for the Word. My soul thirsts for the Word. My, thir my soul longs and thirsts for God. Amen? And so David had a real hunger for the things of God. And so he was, he was filled. David was filled as a young man. He had all the characteristics of the people in the book of Acts. That man was bold. He proclaimed the word of God boldly. 
that he was, he was full of faith. Amen? And actually, let's just look at that. In 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16. Now, they, David did not have the Holy Spirit like we do, so we actually have more of an advantage than he did. But I'm telling you, he had God on his life, amen? He was filled with the power and the presence of God. And on 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 4, the Bible says, and, and this here is where Samuel went to anoint David to be king. This is where he went to, to choose David. He says, so Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, surely the Lord anointed is before him but the Lord said to Samuel do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him for the Lord does not see as man sees for man looks at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart amen so we see here that and let me tell you some things about Samuel you know God told him don't look at the the outer part I look at the heart don't look at his height or his statue. But let me tell you some things about Samuel. Samuel, when he came to anoint David, at this time he was an old man. Samuel knew more about God than probably anybody in the land. He had been in the ministry and served the Lord as a child. He knew how God thought. He had been used by God to pick out the last king. He knew that men acted different on the inside than they looked on the outside. He knew that. Samuel was not easily duped. Did you ever think about that? He was not easily duped. And he looked at Eliab... And he said, surely, I mean, he, he saw him and he said, surely the Lord's anointed stands before him. Surely this is the one. He was so sure of it, so convinced of it. He said, there's no reason to go any further. He said, I, I've seen him right here. The, this, is, this is him. It's got to be him. I believe that Samuel saw more than just his height or his statue. I believe that Eliab had what it took to be a king. I believe he had the kingly swag or whatever it was. I believe he carried himself in such a way. I mean, he had the goods. He had it, man. He had to have to fool someone like Samuel. He had counseled a lot of people. He had seen a lot of stuff by this time. He was by no means unwise. And I said all that to say this. The thing that Eliab lacked was he wasn't filled. He had it, man. He had everything that it took. But he wasn't filled, one small problem. And so I submit to you this, that God is more experienced, or he's more interested in you being filled than in your experience. Did you hear me? Being filled means more to God than any kind of experience. Eliab was more qualified than David was. Amen? Eliab had it more than David did. He was older. He knew more. 
He had more abilities. But David was filled. David hungered for God. Amen. Hallelujah. Actually, hold your place right here. Let's go to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, chapter 6. I believe that this is an admonition to you from the Lord this morning. Acts chapter 6. Hallelujah. Verse 1. The Bible says, Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were being, they were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Verse 3, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men. We're going to put seven men over this and food administration. These guys are going to oversee this. And these are the qualities that they have to have. They have to have gone to Ivy Tech for three years and have three degrees in accounting. And they need to have a history of at least seven months in the study of the flow of the distribution. And all of the breakdowns and all that. Doesn't say that, does it? Hey, this is a secular job here. This is not the word of God and prayer. This is doing a secular job. This is overseeing food administration. What are the requirements? Seek out from among you, it says, seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit. It's a requirement. Why would you have to be full of the Holy Spirit to be over the food administration? The same reason you would have to be full of the Spirit to do anything else that you do. God uses filled people. God uses people who are filled. That's what he's looking for. He's looking for filled, filled people. Full of the Holy Spirit. Full of the Word. And anybody can get filled. Amen? You know? So let's, let's jump back, back to 1 Samuel here. And let's, let's go to... Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel 17. Let me show you something else. Verse 28. 1 Samuel 17, 28. Uh, actually, let's, let's back up to verse 26. We know this story when David was going to go kill the Goliath. We know all about that. We know what happened. But right before he went out to face the giant in verse 26, he's asking the people, you know, what's the, what's the prize? If I, if I take him down, what do I get? And uh, verse 26, Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? How many of you know David here is filled? He's bold. He's full of faith. Amen. And the people answered him, in this manner saying, so shall it be done for the man who kills him. Verse 28 says, Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, 
And Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. You see Eliab's response? Eliab has got some issues with David. And that can happen when you're failed. People who aren't failed can get jealous of people who are. People who aren't failed can get envious of people who are. You see that? Eliab would not have had to respond that way. Man, he could have jumped on that. He could have said, yeah, this is my younger brother. Amen, and, and I tell you, uh, I taught him well. <laughs> he could have said anything but that. Amen. But no, he got mad. He got really mad. And he said, why, you know, you just came down here to see the fight and so on and so forth. And, and why, you know, why are you, why are you think you can do this and all? He didn't believe in him. Let's, let's look at Galatians chapter 5 and verse 26. I'll just give you a scripture on that if you want it. Galatians chapter 5, verse 26. Because I think this is something important that we need to know as well. Galatians chapter 5, verse 26, and I'll start in 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Do you see that? Look at the Amplified, if you could put that up. It says, if we live by the Holy Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. If by the Holy Spirit we have our life in God, let us go forward, walking in line our conduct controlled by the Spirit. Let us not become vainglorious and self-conceited, competitive and challenging, and provoking and irritating to one another, envying and being jealous of one another. Does that stuff go on? It does go on, don't it? People getting jealous of other people. People envying other people. But instead of being jealous, we just need to get filled. Listen. That's your high calling in the body, is to get filled. Get filled with the Spirit. Get filled with the Word. God will find you. I said God will find you. He knows. Nobody else needs to know. <laughs> God found David. He will find you. He will use you. He'll promote you. God needs filled people. He doesn't have enough. Don't look at any position here and envy the person in that position. Don't do that. Don't, no, no. You need to be happy with who you are. You need to like who you are. You, you have a place. You have a gift. You have a calling. Amen. You know, it says not to be competitive with one another. Jesus had that problem in his church. <laughs> you know, with the disciples. They were walking one day, and when they got home, Jesus said, uh, what were you guys talking about? And they got quiet because, you know, what, what they were talking about was, who's the greatest? They were arguing who was the greatest. That's competitive. And it's not right. Even if the disciples did it, it ain't right. It's wrong. I'm greater than you are. And I know we're a sanctified bunch here. None of us would ever do that. But people think it. Maybe, right? People do think. Compare themselves with other people. And, oh man, Pastor Michelle, she put a tweet this morning. She brought a tweet and I said, man, I got, I got to get this in my notes. This is from my message today. She said... 
Did any of you get her tweet this morning? One back there got it. She said, walking in my own shoes is a better fit than walking in someone else's shoes. Amen. Why are you looking at someone else, looking at what they got? Let's look at 1 Corinthians. Now, I know this message might not be for everybody here, but, you know, you you can take notes and share them with with those who uh, need it. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12, it says, For as the body is one and has many members. Everybody say many. 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 The body of Christ has many, many members. Do, do you all get that point? That the body of Christ has many members. Each member has a place. So there's many places in the body. Many. Everybody say many. Many. Just in case you didn't get that. Okay? But all the members of that one body being many. There it is again. Why does he keep saying that? All the members of that one body being many are one body. So also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Oh, and by the way, verse 14. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. (laughs) He's trying to get a point across here. The body is big. The place is that a person can function in are vast. There's places here that God wants to put you in that have not even come into fruition yet. There's places that will start with you. Did you hear me? But you may have to get filled before you can discover it and walk in it. But don't ever think, I wish I could have that place. There are so many places. So there's places you haven't even thought of. Amen. He goes on to say, If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? What's going on here? (laughs) Well, the foot is looking at the hand, right? And wishing it could be a hand. Right? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Well, of course it is. Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? Verse 18 says, but now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body as he pleases. You know, God has already placed each and every one of us. We've already been placed. He has placed us. uh, If you could look at the Amplified on verse 18. If you've got it, Sue. But as it is, God has placed and arranged the limbs and organs in the body, each particular one of them, just as he wished and saw fit and with the best adaption. Isn't that where you'd want to be? I mean, that's where I'd want to be. I want to be where I'm adapted to be, and I want to be where I fit the best. Did you hear me? So God has already placed you, and like I said, the high high calling here of everybody here and the job of everybody here is to be filled. Amen. To walk in your place, to be filled. Walking in my own shoes is a better fit than walking in someone else's. That's where you're going to have the most peace, the most joy. That's where you'll do the best. Amen. I have about 10 minutes 
And I'm going to talk a little bit, give an example of how to be filled, and then uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. In Matthew chapter 17, Matthew chapter 17, We saw here where uh, Pastor Scott read this, and uh, it really ministered to me. He read this on a Wednesday, and while he was reading it, the Lord showed me some things here. Uh, Matthew chapter 17, verse 14. It says, When they had come to the multitude, Jesus here is coming back from the Mount of Transfiguration, it says, a man came to him, kneeling down to him, and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Verse 17, then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation. He said faithless, didn't he? How long shall I be with you and how long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. Verse 18, and re Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said, because of your unbelief, or other translations say, because of your little faith, for assuredly I say to you that if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Verse 21, however, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Amen. He said, this kind does not go out but by prayer and fasting. Now the disciples asked Jesus, why couldn't we do it? Why couldn't we cast him out? We stood by that boy and we said the exact same things you did. We know how to do it. We've been doing it for a long time. We said the exact same things that you said. Why didn't he come out for us? And Jesus said, because of your little faith. And then he said, this kind does not come out but by prayer and fasting. Well, Jesus had just gotten back from the Mount of Transfiguration. He had been up on the mountain. He was in the presence of God. He was talking to Moses and Elijah. And when he came walking back down, that demon did not have a chance. Didn't have a chance. He said... Verse 18, Jesus rebuked a demon, and it came out of him. You see that? Jesus rebuked a demon, and it came out of him. Amen. But this kind does not come out but by prayer and fasting. You know, prayer is, a, is an area when it comes to length of time in prayer that a lot of people won't go to that realm. They won't, they won't do that. They won't go to that extra step that it takes to deal with certain situations. And I believe that there are some situations that we face where it has come down to you need to get into prayer over this in more than just five or ten minutes. And until you do... You're not going to be able to deal with the situation. There are some things that you need to have enlightened. Amen. And, and a lot of people won't go there. But God wants you to. He wants you to be, and that's one way to get it filled, is to go, go into prayer. I'm a real stickler for praying for about an hour. A lot of people will never do that. They, they, they never have gone that long. And you can't always do that. I understand that. I mean, if you have three kids like I do, you can't always do that. But from time to time, it's good to get into prayer for more than just five or ten minutes. Did you hear me? I know Pastor Scott, he prays a lot. And, and I remember when um, we had sold 
we had sold our home, or we were in the process of buying our home, and we were between houses, so we were staying at his house. And I woke up one morning, and he came down the stairs, and he was praying in tongues. And he said, there's some things that, some questions, some, some things I'm, I'm, I'm just praying about. I need some wisdom on some stuff, and I'm just praying about it. You know, he was up early praying. He'll go, you know, for days at a time and just get away and pray. How many of you know what that's worth? I'm thankful for a pastor who prays. I remember one time when we were in the office and, and we were in a financial crunch. I mean, it, we didn't know what to do. We looked like we'd come up against a, a brick wall. And I remember what pastor did. He brought us in here, me and him, Pastor Michelle, and we sat in here and we prayed. That was his answer. We prayed in tongues. And it wasn't long, you know, the situation left like it had never been there. I don't know what happened, but I know it left. It's gone. Amen. And so um, prayer for an extended period is a real good way to get filled. Praying in the Spirit. Amen. One of the reasons I'm a stickler for praying about an hour is because it's how long Jesus prayed in the garden. In the garden of Gethsemane. He came back and said to his other disciples, could you not watch with me for an hour? Which means that he went away and prayed for an hour. I also heard Brother Kenneth Hagin say that it takes about an hour to get in the Spirit. Man, when he said that, it changed my life. And I've seen that to be true. It takes about an hour to shut your mind down, you know, where your mind gets quiet and you can really sense God's presence. And I've found out a lot of answers in prayer. Now, you can't find out everything in an hour, but you can find a lot out in an hour. It's amazing. I could tell you story after story of things that I found out from God praying for about an hour, and I'll tell you, that'll fill you up. When you hear from God, that will fill you up. I mean, you come downstairs charred. You heard from God, man. There's nothing like it. There is nothing like it. I'm not talking about hearing an audible voice. I'm talking about him speaking up something on the inside of you. There is nothing like it. A lot of people have excuses why they don't pray for an hour. They say, well, what if I don't... I wrote down the excuses. Um, they say... What if I don't get anything? I might not get anything. So then I wasted a whole hour. <laughs> what if I don't get anything? What if you do? Do you know what that would do to you? I mean, people buy homes, people get jobs, and they never really, they never really pray for any extended length of time. I mean, you can't pray for an hour about everything. But there are some things you should. You should get God's wisdom on because it takes a long time and a lot of money to clean up a mess. Did you hear me? And that's what you get a lot of times when you're not sensitive to God. Amen. Yeah, what if I don't get anything? Well, first of all, if you pray in tongues over that situation, you're already praying out God's will where that's concerned. And you are doing some things about that situation. You may come out of it not knowing exactly what to do, but I guarantee you, you're coming away from it better than you went in. Because you prayed about it. God will honor that. You taking the time to come before God for about an hour to pray about it is honorable to God. People say, well, I'm not spiritual enough. You don't have to be a spiritual giant to hear from God. You just have to have faith 
and take the time to do it. People don't take the time to do it. That's where, I mean, it's important. It's important to get refilled from time to time. Amen. Anybody getting anything? You guys are really quiet. I'm not spanking you, am I? People say I'm not that spiritual. I don't, I don't think I could hear from him. Praying in tongues and reading in your Bible, what comes to mind? Meditating on it with some soft music will get you a long way towards the answer to being filled. Amen. I want to share one more scripture, then we'll stop. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Every one of you in here can hear from God. And you guys have questions. Some of you have been getting counsel. And you don't need counsel. You need to hear from God. I can't, you know, pastors can't tell you what to do. They can't tell you what you're calling. There, there are some things you just have to get from God. I would be wrong to give you my 10 cents on it. Because I don't know. Amen. I'm not saying you can't get counsel. I'm not saying that. But there are some things, like I said. Like Pastor always said, one man said, what shall we do? The other man said, I believe we ought to pray for it, about it. And the other guy said, has it come to that? <laughs> yeah, it's come to that. You need to pray. So James chapter 1. James chapter 1. In the NIV, if you need an answer from God and you get into prayer, you'll get the answer and you'll also get filled. I mean, like I said, when you hear from God, that, that does something to you. I was up upstairs praying one day and um, it was a Sunday morning. And God showed me something about what he was doing for me. And, and it just... It, it was so amazing. I, he opened my eyes. And I got so filled with the Spirit. I came to church and was sitting right there. And Pastor Scott could sense it. He said, I want you to preach. I want you to minister. That happened because I was filled. And I was filled, man. <laughs> and when I ministered, I had my guns loaded. I'm telling you. So um, in James chapter 1, verse 5. The Bible says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. It says, let him ask in faith. Don't doubt, but ask in faith. Listen, if you ask God for wisdom about anything, he will give it to you generously and it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've done wrong. Nothing, nothing matters. You just have to have faith and he'll give it to you. He'll give it to you generously and he will not find one fault with you. Not one. Well, I'm not spiritual about it enough. He'll overlook that. Well, I never pray enough. He'll overlook that. Well, I never get in the Word. He'll overlook that. Get in the Word now. You can do this. Amen? All right, well, I'll let you, I'll let you off the hook now. <laughs> Amen. All right. Pastor Scott and Michelle, thank you for watching Impact Television a part of the media ministry from Forgiven Church, now in two locations, Bluffton and Fort Wayne, Indiana. Great things continue to happen at Forgiven Church, and we want to give you a special invite to attend one of our life-changing services. Whether you'll be attending church for the first time, haven't been to church in a long time, or maybe you're in transition for a new place to worship, 
we invite you to a place where we are not perfect, but we know that we are forgiven. For more information, you can go to our website at ForgivenOnline.org. Again, that is ForgivenOnline.org. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you at church.